Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is the mechanical properties of squirrel cage induction motors. Our objective is to examine the mechanical properties of the most popular three-phase AC motor in the known universe, the squirrel cage induction motor. We'll examine the construction and theory of operation of squirrel cage induction motors, as well as examine their torque and speed profiles. I have been looking forward to this lecture for quite some time, as I'm certain you have as well. Without overstating their importance, squirrel cage induction motors make society function. They are the actuator of choice for numerous applications and are found absolutely everywhere. As the term frisbee is synonymous with flying disc and juggalo is synonymous with dirty, dirty, paint huffing subhuman, when people use the term motor, they most likely mean squirrel cage induction motor. They are simply that popular. Unless explicitly stated otherwise, you can assume every time I say motor, I mean squirrel cage induction motor. The popularity of squirrel cage induction motors stems from several identifying characteristics. Principally, squirrel cage induction motors are inexpensive, easy to manufacture, relatively efficient, and necessitate no electrical connections to the rotor. The simple fact that squirrel cage induction motors don't require electrical connection to the moving rotor means they are mechanically simple, reliable, and don't require much maintenance. In fact, squirrel cage induction motors are so reliable, you often see motors installed 20 or 30 years ago regularly performing the same task day after day. If only the crap they make nowadays could last so long. Let's first examine construction of a three-phase AC squirrel cage induction motor. Like all motors, the principal element of a squirrel cage induction motor are the stator and the rotor. The stator is the stationary part, and the rotor is the rotating part. Get it? Stator, stationary, rotor, rotating? The stator of a squirrel cage induction motor, for all intents and purposes, is absolutely indistinguishable from a stator in a wound rotor induction motor, an electrically excited synchronous motor, or a permanent magnet synchronous motor. They all do the same thing. When excited by three-phase AC, the stator produces a rotating magnetic field. We learned in the rotating magnetic field lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, the synchronous speed, i.e. the speed of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator, is directly proportional to the excitation frequency and inversely proportional to the number of pole pairs per phase. Long story short, increased frequency and synchronous speed will increase. Conversely, decreased frequency and synchronous speed will decrease. Conversely, if we were to increase the number of pole pairs per phase, synchronous speed would decrease. And if we decrease the number of pole pairs per phase, synchronous speed would increase. If we're stuck using a fixed excitation frequency, let's say 60 Hertz in the United States, this results in certain predictable synchronous speeds. A motor with two pole pairs per phase or a single pole per phase operated at 60 Hertz would have a synchronous speed of 3,600 RPM. Whereas a motor with four pole pairs per phase or two poles per phase operated at 60 Hertz would have a synchronous speed of 1,800 RPM. Whereas a motor with six pole pairs per phase or three poles per phase operated at 60 Hertz would have a synchronous speed of 1,200 RPM and so on. These same motors operate at a reduced excitation frequency of 50 Hertz in the EU in a country with a functional government and working healthcare system would have proportionally reduced synchronous speeds. Used to be manufacturers would offer a selection of motors with a wide range of numbers of pole pairs per phase. However, the advent of a power electronics device known as a motor drive, a variable frequency drive, VFD or inverter that can vary excitation voltage magnitude and frequency has largely reduced the need for this level of variety. Oftentimes, the user can simply purchase an inverter rated motor with a fixed number of pole pairs per phase and then use a motor drive to vary excitation frequency and thus rotational speed. Lower frequency output means a slower synchronous speed, whereas higher frequency means a faster synchronous speed. Inverter rated, by the way, means a motor stator with sufficiently robust wiring and insulation that can withstand the higher voltage spike produced by motor drives and can run at very slow speeds without overheating. We'll examine motor drives in later lectures. Like I said earlier, squirrel cage induction motors, wound rotor induction motors, electrically excited synchronous motors, and permanent magnet synchronous motors, for all intents and purposes, have the same type of stator. Really, only the rotor distinguishes one type of motor from the other. The title squirrel cage induction motor implies two distinguishing rotor characteristics. Number one, it looks like a squirrel cage or a hamster wheel. The core of a squirrel cage induction motor rotor consists of a cage-like structure enclosed in laminated iron sheets to concentrate the magnetic field. The conductive cage is often formed of copper or cast aluminum and is astoundingly simple and inexpensive to make. 
Imagine conductive bars spanning the length of the rotor linked together with two conductive rings forming a cylindrical cage-like structure. You can't really see the cage inside a real squirrel cage induction motor because it's buried in laminated sheets of iron to concentrate the magnetic field. Number two, squirrel cage induction motors operate off the principle of induction. The rotor cage has no physical electrical connection to the stator. The rotor and stator are isolated from one another, just like the primary and secondary windings of a transformer. In fact, squirrel cage induction motors were often referred to as rotating transformers in their early developmental stages. One can think of the stator as the primary winding and the rotor as the secondary. When current flows in the primary stator winding, it creates a magnetic field which interacts with the secondary winding on the rotor, such that current is induced to flow in the rotor. The resultant rotor current produces its own magnetic field, which is then attracted to the stator rotating magnetic field and pulled or dragged along with it. Because of the numerous interactions involved, this might take a little thought and imagination on your part. Feel free to rewind or replay this next part as many times as you need to let it sink in. Consider one pole pair inside the stator where the rotating magnetic field is revolving clockwise and a cross section of two conductive bars inside the rotor cage. The pole pairs establish a magnetic field oriented north to south between them. As the rotating magnetic field sleeps clockwise, this would be equivalent to keeping the magnetic field stationary and pushing the two conductive bars counterclockwise. I say again, as the rotating magnetic field sweeps clockwise, this would be functionally equivalent to keeping the magnetic field stationary and turning the two conductive bars counterclockwise. There is relative movement of a conductor in a changing magnetic field. Current will be induced in these conductors via the right-hand generator rule. An application of the right-hand generator rule demonstrates induced conventional current in the top bar comes out of the screen, signified by a dot, and induced conventional current in the bottom bar would go into the screen, signified by a cross. This is the first half of the process. The rotating magnetic field on the stator has induced current on the rotor. The current flowing in the rotor bars creates its own magnetic field. Via the right-hand corkscrew rule, the magnetic field produced by the current in the top bar rotates counterclockwise. Similarly, via the right-hand corkscrew rule, the magnetic field produced by the current in the bottom bar rotates clockwise. The magnetic fields on the stator poles and the rotor will interact with one another. The magnetic field on the left of the top bar is aiding, whereas the magnetic field on the right of the top bar is opposing. These fields coalesce such that there are more lines of magnetic force on the left of the top bar. Similarly, the magnetic field on the left of the bottom bar is opposing, whereas the magnetic field on the right of the bottom bar is aiding. These magnetic fields coalesce such that there are more lines of magnetic force on the right. The unified magnetic field acts to push the top bar right and the bottom bar left. This twisting force results in clockwise rotor movement in the same direction of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator. You may wish to rewind and watch that sequence again. Long story short, current is induced on the rotor by the stator rotating magnetic field. Then the resultant rotor current and its associated magnetic field interacts with the same stator rotating magnetic field such that the rotor is twisted or dragged along with it. The last half of the sequence can also be more succinctly explained using the left-hand motor rule which states a current carrying wire in a magnetic field will feel a resultant force. Fingers of the extended left hand are oriented north to south, and conventional current leaves the left palm. Here the left thumb indicates the direction of travel. The left hand motor rule applied to the conductive bar on the rotors similarly demonstrates the top bar moves right and the bottom bar moves left, twisting or dragging the rotor along clockwise in the same direction of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator. Again, I'm encouraging you to rewind this sequence as many times as you need to let it sink in. Lest you think that's it, there's a third phenomenon known as counter-electromotive force that takes place that I've yet to discuss. Key to this series of interactions between magnetism, electricity, and movement is the important qualifier, changing magnetism. Induction does not occur if the magnetic field doesn't change. We saw how the state of rotating magnetic field sweeps through the conductive bars on the rotor. This act of being passed by the rotating magnetic field means the conductive bars on the rotor experience a changing magnetic field and thus experience induced current. As a result, the rotor twists or chase after the stator rotating magnetic field. This observation explains an important property of squirrel cage induction motors, and for that matter, all induction style motors. That property being, induction motors do not rotate at synchronous speed, 
but rather lag behind synchronous speed, even in the unloaded state. I say again, induction motors do not rotate at synchronous speed, but rather lag behind synchronous speed, even in the unloaded state. To put it another way, the state of rotating magnetic field is always ever so slightly faster than the rotor, such that the state of rotating magnetic field regularly catches up with and overlaps the rotor. To use a rather apt analogy, consider Captain America and Falcon running laps in the movie Winter Soldier. If you haven't seen Winter Soldier yet, pause the lecture and go watch it. I will not have anyone that deficient of culture in my class. Matter of fact, I need you to watch all 23 movies of the Marvel Cinematic Universe if you haven't done so already. There's probably 50 by now, so get cracking. Give yourself some time because you probably want to watch Thor Ragnarok twice. Anyways, you recall Sam Wilson is giving it all, running laps, and along comes Captain America running the same circuit but a much faster pace, and he repeatedly passes him. Captain America is the stator rotating magnetic field. Sam Wilson is the rotor. They're both running laps, but they're out of sync with one another because Captain America is slightly faster, which is what you'd expect given they injected it with a 1940s chemical cocktail of Red Bull, Viagra, and Speed and cooked him in a microwave just to make sure. If my cartoonish graphics didn't do the trick, here's a quick demonstration of induction I never tire of. Consider a large ball of copper. Let's pretend the copper ball is the rotor. Is copper magnetic? When I place a strong permanent magnet in close proximity to the copper ball, the copper ball is neither attracted nor repulsed by the magnetic field. So no, copper in ordinary circumstances isn't a magnetic material. Now, consider the copper ball's reaction to a changing magnetic field meant to simulate the rotating magnetic field on the stator. As the changing magnetic field sweeps through the copper ball, it induces current on the ball. The current flowing in the ball creates its own magnetic field, which interacts with a moving magnetic field such that the ball is twisted or dragged along with it. This illustrates the motor action inside a squirrel cage induction motor. Pretty cool, eh? One could observe similar effects given a different frame of reference. Consider a stationary magnetic field and a moving conductor. As the ball is spun, it experiences relative movement of the magnetic field and induction again occurs. This illustrates generator action inside an asynchronous generator. We'll examine asynchronous generators in later lectures. Long story short, the rotor is out of sync with the stator for induction machines. This is what creates the changing magnetic field necessary for the induction process. And it's largely for this reason induction style motors are sometimes called asynchronous motors, meaning the rotor is not synchronized with the stator rotating magnetic field, but rather lags behind it in motor mode. We'll examine generator mode where the rotor leads the stator in later lectures. This degree of lag or lead is sometimes called slip and typically expressed as a percentage of synchronous speed. Percentage slip can be calculated as the difference between the rotating speed of the rotor and the synchronous speed over the synchronous speed times 100%. Consider a squirrel cage induction motor with a synchronous speed of 1,800 RPM. In the unloaded condition, let's say the rotor turns at 1,780 RPM. As one might expect, this is sometimes referred to as the no load speed. The rotor lags synchronous speed by 20 RPM, or 20 RPM is roughly 1.1% of synchronous speed at 1800 RPM. In the unloaded condition, the rotor is spinning relatively quickly, however it exerts no torque, i.e. it's unloaded or free spinning. An application of the mechanical power formula, where mechanical power is equal to torque times rotational speed over 9.55, demonstrates the motor produces no mechanical power in the unloaded condition. If we were to plot torque and mechanical power output on the vertical y-axis and speed on the horizontal x-axis, we'd be at the far right of the motor's operational curve. Notice the horizontal x-axis doesn't start at 0 RPM, but rather the horizontal axis spans 1200 to 1800 RPM. I'll explain why in a moment. In the unloaded condition, the motor slightly lags synchronous speed of 1800 RPM at roughly 1780 RPM and produces no torque and no mechanical power. Consider the same motor in the loaded condition, exerting 1.1 newton meters of torque at let's say 1710 RPM. The rotor now lags synchronous speed by 90 RPM, where 90 RPM is 5% of synchronous speed. In the loaded condition, oppositional torque increases, the rotor slows, and slip increases. Application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the motor produces roughly 197 watts of mechanical power, slightly more than a quarter horsepower. If we were to define this as typical operating conditions this particular motor was designed for, we might expect to see a rated speed of 17 RPM and a rated mechanical power output of roughly 197 watts in the motor nameplate. As one might expect, this is sometimes referred to as the rated speed 
where the motor produces its rated torque and its rated mechanical power output. If we were to plot torque as a function of speed, we'd see a roughly linear transition from 0 Nm at the no-load speed of 1780 RPM up to 1.1 Nm at the rated speed of 1710 RPM. Similarly, if we were to plot mechanical power as a function of speed, we'd also see a roughly linear transition from 0 watts at the no-load speed at 1780 RPM up to 197 watts at the rated speed of 1710 RPM. There's understandable limits to this linear relationship of increased oppositional torque and slip. One might expect this motor to experience some peak torque output and then a subsequent decline. Let's say this motor's peak torque output of 2.2 Nm occurs at 1260 RPM. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the motor producing 2.2 Nm of torque at 1260 RPM yields roughly 290.3 watts of mechanical power. This is not peak mechanical power output, but it is peak torque. Any increase in slip would have the motor enter what is known as the breakdown region, where torque output actually decreases as rotational speed decreases. It is for this reason the peak or maximum torque produced by an induction motor is often referred to as the breakdown torque. You recall, mechanical power is the product of torque and speed. Peak mechanical power output does not occur at peak torque, nor does it occur at peak speed, but rather the product of torque and speed produces a maximum. This ordinarily occurs just before peak torque. Let's say this motor produces peak mechanical power output of 300 watts at 1365 RPM. An algebraic rearrangement of the mechanical power formula, solving for torque, would demonstrate that the motor produces roughly 2.1 newton meters of torque at peak power conditions. Before we examine the breakdown region, consider the plot of torque as a function of rotational speed from zero newton meters to maximum torque. It'd be easy to describe torque versus speed as roughly linear inside this region, especially at or near the rated conditions. Yes, it does taper off as it nears breakdown. However, if you ignore the roll off, it's kind of linear. If you think about it, the motor is kind of behaving like you'd expect. Load the motor, it slows down. Unload the motor, it speeds up. If we define the motor's rated condition as producing 1.1 newton meters of torque at 1710 RPM, or 197 watts of mechanical power, any reduction in load would see the motor producing less than 1.1 newton meters, rotating faster than 1710 RPM, and producing less than 197 watts of mechanical power. At the rated output and less, the motor is ordinarily capable of running in this fashion without issues, more or less continuously, unless the motor is specifically designated as having an intermittent duty cycle. Operating at anything less than the rated conditions means the motor is underloaded. Conversely, any increase in load beyond the rated condition would see the motor producing more than 1.1 newton meters, rotating slower than 1710 RPM, and producing more than 197 watts of mechanical power. Above the rated output, the motor is in an overload condition and isn't intended to operate in this fashion for any length of time without the risk of damage. An example of a brief but permissible overload be an electrical saw hitting a knot in a piece of wood. The motor experiences a brief overload event, but the overload isn't sustained for any length of time. Motors are ordinarily operated at or around the rated conditions. Inside the breakdown region, things go south rather quickly. Expanded plots of torque and mechanical power as a functional rotational speed might look something like this. Any decrease in rotational speed or increase in slip beyond the breakdown torque We'll see the motor's usable torque decrease, settle, and then briefly rise again as speed decreases and slip increases. This breakdown region corresponds with decreased mechanical power output. At the locked rotor condition, i.e. a rotational speed of 0 RPM, the motor can produce a respectable amount of torque, let's say 1.4-ish newton meters. Torque is respectably high, but the shaft isn't moving. An application of the mechanical power formula at locked rotor conditions demonstrates the motor yields 0 watts of mechanical power. Complete plots of torque and mechanical power for the entire range of rotational speed reinforce our earlier observations. Don't mechanically overload the motor, and if you do, don't overload it for very long. Not only will efficiency be poor, we've yet to discuss electrical properties and efficiency, the motor is not operating at peak conditions. Again, ideally a motor is intended to operate at or around its rated conditions specified in the motor nameplate. Inside this ideal region, it behaves pretty predictably. Load it up, it slows down, unload it, and it speeds up. 